Book clubbers, <laughs> readers, dancers, it's that time. Uh, we took last week off. Thank you for sticking with us. I had a little vacation, I had a birthday, and I got a birthday present, Lana. We have mm-hmm. oh, Lana Bashinsky's here. Hi, Lana. Hi, <laughs> I'm here. I'm Jeff Kanata. We are here. <laughs> And we have reason to dance this week. Most of the time, we just uh, get the groove bec- from the song, uh, which is reason enough to dance. But we have a big reason to dance this week. And that is because we got to sit down with Mr. Steven Erickson himself, gracing us with his presence, uh, just being so generous with his time. I'm so excited. It-, it was an amazing experience getting a chance to talk to him, right? Oh, it was so Great. Not only does it like confuse me with like the inspiration and like how touching and thoughtful he is as an author, yeah. but also infuse me with the chill vibes, the laid back, good feelings. You love to see it. Well, let's get right into it and bring him on, Mr. Steven Erickson. We are joined now, uh, I am delighted to say, by the author of the Malazan Books of the Fallen and many other novels. It is our joy to welcome Mr. Steven Erickson to the show. Hello, Mr. Erickson. Hello, and it's an absolute delight to be here, for sure. Well, uh, we, uh, as you know, have been, mm-hmm. uh, we have begun our journey as two completely new readers of the uh, Malazan books. And we are only two novels in. We have completed uh, Dead House Gates. We're about mm-hmm. to start uh, Memories of Ice uh, next week. So I, it is our hope that this discussion will keep us relatively spoiler free. <laughs> I can imagine that might be difficult for you having all of it uh, in in your head. <clears throat> but uh, our hope for the re- for the viewers and for us is that we will be able to focus on uh, the first two novels and not have too many spoilers for other stuff. But uh, we are going to we are delighted to have you. And like I said, uh, we have loved the novels, uh, the first two that we have read, and it is. Um, it is really cool to talk to you here. I, you, we had to reschedule this because uh, you were on an archaeological dig, right? Yeah. How did that go? Um, <clears throat> well, it was in southwest Manitoba. Um, it was a site about 14 kilometers away from the a very small town called Melita. And uh, it was a brutal reminder that um, digging in a pit it's actually for young people, not old people. <laughs> my knees and my back. Oh, my goodness. Um, but at the same time, it was absolutely fabulous. Uh, it was a great reset for me. Um, I didn't have to worry about anything else. Um, you know, I wasn't part of the, uh, the archaeologist um, administrating the program or, or you know, the, the excavation itself. All I had to do was take a trowel and jump into a pit and start digging. And it was a blast. Uh, Absolutely how, blessed. How do you even get involved with that in the first place? Uh, something that I've mentioned on the show, um, where reading the books and in general, I sort of very intentionally done no research into the Malazan books at all or into you, watched your other shows. So even when we go into this, apologies if I'm like sounding a lot more dense than I hope I do. But uh, how do you get involved with like, casually volunteering in archaeological digs like where did that Um, start well i mean no i i I worked as an archaeologist for about 18 years so wow yeah uh, it was my first degree um and i think i did the field school after my first year at university so um i did a count uh on the flight over uh, to winnipeg i think i've worked on 23 projects 24 now holy moly Um, all over the world basically and uh, i my great love in archaeology was field work. It was not the academic side of things at all. So um, <clears throat> one of the one of the people I know in Winnipeg who's still in archaeology, um, actually him and, him and his wife, his wife is actually working, I think she's co-director on that project. 
So just to people already knew, um, as soon as I heard that they were going to run uh, a 14 day uh, excavation uh, out at the site, <clears throat> I just said, I'm happy to volunteer. And um, we arranged it. And that's what I did. Amazing. It's so cool. I, I obviously speaking from a place of, of ignorance on, on that topic, I always think of archaeology as something that has already been done, you know, that there's a new stuff to discover. I feel like it's amazing to me that there's still new things to discover in this modern age. You can still, you know, dig a hole and find uh, old civilizations and artifacts and things. There is more to discover um, than we have ever excavated to this point. Wow. Um, even the site we were on, um, it's there's a small sort of creek, I guess, that runs through basically prairie. And um, it's, it's carved out a, a fairly deep, uh, or relatively deep uh, valley. But it's also surrounded by high ground. And that ground is was the first dry land um, in all of Manitoba when the glaciers uh, retreated. So it has on it probably occupations going back at least 11,000 years. Wow. But we were only interested that this project is only interested in uh, very recent stuff, relatively speaking. It's it's mm. the beginnings of agriculture, indigenous agriculture, um, before the Europeans arrived. So uh, I guess we're talking for that time period, 1400, 1500, 1600, thereabouts. Mm. Um, and that's the only thing that, that this excavation was interested in was to my mind, a very re recent stuff. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not even been looked at in terms of uh, paleo, um, like a really early 10,000, 8,000, whatever. Um, yeah. And that's yet to be discovered. And yet they've been working wow. on this site for five years now. I think. Wow. So, so you're like digging and you're there. like, Oh no, these are dinosaur bones. Ugh. And just yeah, throw those <laughs> yeah. on your shoulder. Too old. <laughs> Too old. Need the more recent stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, um, it's it's clear that that is infused in your writing and your mm. love of uh, history and and civilizations and anthropology is it certainly comes through. Um, I I was shocked to hear you say on another show. I, I've tried my best to uh, listen to as many interviews with you as possible so as to not pummel you with questions you've answered a million times. Um, but I, I just was shocked to hear you say that you don't reread your own writing. No. Is that true? Yeah, unless forced to. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> if I have to go back and, um, and sort of remind myself uh, you know you mentioned that you know you're worried about spoilers uh, because i've got all these novels in my head well if they're in my head they're in a room i, I can't even find the door to uh, <laughs> it has been too long it's been way too long um so as you as you're reading um and you come each week to discuss things you're actually reminding me of things that i'd forgotten about that's, that's so exactly that's, what, what i was going to ask you about what, yeah. what is the experience like seeing new readers step through the the novels uh, it, it's always surprising um, because there are certain memories that I have of, of the books and they're just kind of like key moments for me. Um, and I guess there's a part of me that, that is listening carefully to what you're discussing and the things that you are focusing on. Um, and, and not just you, but anybody talking about the books. And I, I'm always sort of kind of waiting for you to latch on to that that same moment, that memory that I share. Mm. And, um, and that, that's, that's always made it very interesting to listen to, uh, you know, what grabs the readers versus what grabs the, the author. Yeah. Um, but also the author who wrote this in 1999 came out in 2000. <laughs> right. So I don't, I don't really know who that guy was, but <laughs> I, I have some of um, those memories. So you've got all this stuff around. I've got all this stuff around. Yeah, it just keeps piling up. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that's always made it interesting to, uh, just to get uh, to get a sense of what it is the readers are, are picking up on, um, and also things readers are um, either mis misinterpreting or whatever, which then you know makes me turn back and see, well, um, how could I have done that differently? How could I have done mm -hmm. that in such a way that it was clear? Um, 
I remember you talking about uh, the Tregal Trade Guild. Mm -hmm. And that was quite interesting because that was very much part of the gaming. Um, and it was the second group, uh, so not Cam and I, but it was uh, a group I was writing who'd become, uh, well, okay, I can't tell you much more than that. But anyways, they become <laughs> major players. Uh, their characters become major players uh, in, the, in uh, a lot of the, the series to come for you guys. So uh, the Trigal Trade Guild was originally uh, rolled up as, as uh, a campaign. And it was just an absolute blast. Um, in fact, I seem to recall I did one campaign where they show up in downtown London in, in modern age, right? In their carriage and they get arrested. <laughs> and, you know, they're thrown in jail. It, it, they haven't got the language. There's no mana, so there's no magic. <laughs> so I was just having a blast with the Trigal Trade Guild. So if you think about that, that's already sort of colonized my brain. It's already in there. Yeah. Um, and so their appearance, um, I did not want, you know, a full Deus Ex, Ex Machina in the sense of saving Coltane and company, um, which is not what they do. Right. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, they, they simply, they hold off the inevitable end uh, right. briefly. Mm -hmm. um, but they do provide something that uh, then, of course, goes wrong anyways. It doesn't stay with Coltane. It goes to Duiker. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, but for me, of course, it feels... It, it just feels familiar. Yeah. Why wouldn't they show up if they were sent there? And you'll get more detail when you get to Memories of Ice. But um, so I guess in that respect, there's a lot of um, things that are set up. It's weird. They're set up in the following books to have an impact in the book you're reading right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is kind of strange, but yeah. that's how it turned out. You know, we've we've definitely gotten that note from lots of uh, viewers <laughs> who are like, just yeah. wait. And it's, yeah. 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 Uh, I think it's interesting, uh, like that trade guild being such a big example because they make such a splash in their first mm -hmm. entrance. But in general, I've talked a lot on our show about how I feel like I am trusted by you as a reader. Mm. Um, there's certainly a world where you could have been a lot more handholdy with the audience in general. Can you talk a little bit about how you sort of developed that relationship with the reader? Like, how did you build up confidence in your writing so that you knew that people would get it or trust that things that are vague early on will become clear? Wow. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I took, I, I ended up getting two degrees in, in creative writing in fiction writing. Um, one was here in Victoria, University of Victoria. It was an undergraduate program. And the other one was in uh, Iowa in the writer's workshop. And I was writing short stories primarily. <clears throat> um, and I guess you would call them uh, contemporary literary fiction, um, which is his own genre. Uh, don't tell them that, but you know, it is. <laughs> and, and, I had drilled into me very early on um, the the presumption of uh, what becomes obvious in a work of fiction that writes down to its readers um, became anathema to me. It was just like, no, you do not do that. Um, and in terms of the, the fantasy, when I finally sort of got to writing these novels, I was certainly thinking that this is stuff I would want to read. And mm. so I was writing to sort of kind of that level. Um, but also it's a co-created world with Ian Eslamont and because we gained this stuff. So he was kind of my audience of one uh, early on. And so I was writing uh, a story um, with a lot of inside jokes that only he would get. Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> so it was, it was definitely... Um, writing across to the audience as opposed to any other, any other, you know, um, positioning. Um, and that idea of writing down just, uh, it, it just felt impossible to me. Um, I'd had the opposite drilled into me from, from day one, um, that you assume, um, that even though you've, you've taken the reader by hand, um, you're going to, you're going to offer up that that sort of sly wink every now and then 
hmm. and recognition that, that the reader is with you as opposed to um, simply a passive member uh, of, of the audience. Uh, you want that reader to accompany you as the writer. Uh, and that, and that, you know, it, it's, it's a measure of respect. Um, mm -hmm. and that's the only way I can approach this kind of stuff. Yeah. So thinking about like how some of these ideas came out from the, the game that you played while you were writing, did you like identify like, oh, these are the pieces I want to bring back later? Or is it, does that sort of tie back into like, you don't like rewrite what you have written. Things just sort of float organically, like something would come up and then later you'd be like, you know what, that should come back. Or... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's the spontaneity of gaming. Uh, I mean, Jeff, you can speak to that, right? Yeah. Um, and it's the fact that as you know, as a writer, you have this uh, false notion that you're in control of your characters, but gaming <laughs> teaches you that you're not in control of your characters, and that's not a bad thing, right? Yeah. It's it's where absolutely amazing stuff can happen. Um, but having said that dead house gates um as a story was never gamed mm. uh, it's entirely fictional um but the world that it's in uh, is is very well realized because of the gaming so it it's as if the gaming was our way of educating ourselves on the history of the malazan world and then once we had all that history in in place we could then uh, individually just sort of jump in anywhere we wanted to and and build a story. I, I'm so fascinated by that. I don't want to dig in uh, in detail, but just to catch up any viewers that might not be familiar, um, the world of Malazan started as a tabletop role playing. Now, you did you start with Dungeons and Dragons specifically? I know you moved to GURPS, but did you start yeah. with D&D specifically? AD&D. AD&D. Wow. The yeah. old old stuff. Yeah. Old stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and which is really cool uh, in <laughs> to my mind. I've always described um, to what you said. I've always described uh, dungeon mastering as uh, telling a stories, telling a story where your main characters don't cooperate. Yeah, um, which is pretty fun. Um, <laughs> but it's great. I, it's great yeah. because it teaches. As a writer, I would recommend any writer um, run a game. It doesn't matter what genre they're writing in. If they're writing mysteries, if they're writing thrillers, whatever, uh, run a game. Um, and, you know, you can set it in this world and GURPS, for example, can, can, can basically provide you the structure to, to run a game set anywhere at any time. Yeah. Um, and it teaches you humility because it teaches <laughs> you, you don't have control of your characters and that's a great thing. Yeah. I've now, disappointed. You... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Lana. I, was gonna say, I disappointed my DM all the time <laughs> where he will be like, I think we're going to like really wrap up this chapter that we're working on today. So maybe we'll run a little long and then we immediately go off on the weeds yeah. as the party. And he's like, I don't know why I thought we'd finish. We're three days away. I'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's great. That's great. I, uh, I, I'm so curious as the, the specifics of how that went down. Now, will you, gaming with the intent of taking this and building it into something else or was it just fun and then later you went oh you know what that could actually be a movie or a tv show or a, a, a novel yeah um initially um we realized that i mean we're both archaeologists and so we both have degrees in anthropology and we were building this world um basically applying a lot of what we learned in terms of building cultures cultures in transition in conflict um and you know, we also have backgrounds in history. So we were just gaming for fun and just, you know, um, sharing a flat and, and killing time, basically. And um, but at some point we thought, well, you know, we've been mod we modified the GURP system. So <clears throat> there's a bit more, even more freewheeling than it already is. And um, so the, the magic system sort of emerged organically from, from how we gained. But we were always driven by narrative um, in the gaming. So there's a very uh, strong literary component component to what we're doing. But at the same time, we're both we're extremely visual in, in sort of how we we uh, describe these things uh, in the gaming. And I think we decided that maybe we could do a a, a world book for GURPS uh, or a mod a modified GURPS. Um, and, and just provide a player's manual and, and that kind of stuff, um, go in that direction. 
And then we gave up on that idea because it looked like way too much work. <laughs> and so then we wrote a, we started writing, we were already writing, co-writing uh, feature film scripts. So we just plunged into uh, writing some fantasy ones and um, setting them all in the Malazan world. So Gardens of the Moon uh, was originally a, uh, a feature film script. Basically, the, uh, I said book seven, the FET, is the, is the film with the only other aspects were uh, some of the rooftop assassin wars that's, mm. you know, that showed up in the novel are the opening scenes of, of the script. And we kind of thought of it in terms of sort of uh, almost an Indiana Jones style, uh, rip roaring adventure kind of thing. Uh, so very different from sort of where it ended up. But I think those elements are sort of lingering in the novel. Um, there's mm. comic elements and there's a lot yeah. of aspects where an obvious uh, trope is set up and then completely subverted. You know, right. so Crocus doesn't get the girl. You know, right. Kind of stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Crocus, my angel. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So it was <clears throat> what we were thinking about. But then being Canadian, um, we had a, a very hard time. Uh, trying to convince anybody on these scripts. Um, well, is there is there an alternate universe where Malazan is only a film franchise? Or uh, wouldn't, that you... be, wouldn't that be wild? Yeah. <laughs> um, so eventually, yeah, we, we got basically despondent. Uh, I went off to Iowa. Cam went to uh, an MFA program in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, and we sort of went off to our own thing, uh, do our own stuff. And uh, I'd written... Uh, a draft of Gardens of the Moon, and he had written a draft of Return of the Crimson Guard. Um, so, yeah, we just basically decided to novelize this stuff and um, see where it took us. Amazing. That's so cool. And it's amazing to me that you even did that at that time, because this is like the early 90s, right? Mm -hmm. That you would have written the film script. Is that accurate? Yeah. So yeah. this is like pre-Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, oh, yeah. right? There, people weren't making grand high fantasy films no no and, and that was our pitch to people like telefilm was that this is the last sort of untapped genre uh for film um and the excuse always was well we can't afford you know the special effects and the budget and all that mm. kind of stuff so we really tried to humanize the story and bring it down to that level and um even then we still couldn't convince anybody so so if you were to pick like like today, you're gonna. There's gonna be an adaptation or something existing in this world. What sort of would be your dream space to see the Malazan Empire exist in? TV, film, video games, just novels, forever. Um, I think I think TV and and uh, a game, a role playing game, sort of built off of the television stuff. Um, mm. I think that's kind of where it's at. I mean, I, we originally thought. We ended up writing two feature film scripts, um, Gardens of the Moon and um, Black Dog Blues, I think it was called. And that was part of the Gena backing campaign that is mentioned in uh, Gardens of the Moon before they, they besiege Pale. Mm -hmm. So it predates that kind of stuff. It's, it's to the north, uh, in the Black Dog Swamp, Black Dog Forest. It was um, a bit more comedic than, than you would expect. But... Uh, we were thinking of, uh, yeah, just continuing to write scripts, feature film scripts uh, set in this, in this kind of setting. And, um, but eventually, you know, reality takes over. And, and when you, when you're told no often enough, um, you just eventually give up, you, mm -hmm. you shelve it. So. Honestly, I get so distracted and delighted just hearing you say any of the words from the book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, well, what? Get it back in. <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh, <laughs> This oh, is right. pronunciation. <laughs> pronunciation. Yes. So this is one of our big questions. Is, yeah. You know, this kind of goes back to uh, Lana's, you know, trusting the reader thing. We, I want to talk about ownership because one of the first comments you put on one of our videos uh, was that the pronunciation doesn't matter. No. Which to me mm -hmm. is a wild <clears throat> thing for an author to say because clearly there is a way you pronounce it in your mind, in your head. Uh, and the idea of giving that up and letting the reader have it. I, I'm so curious what your feelings are about ownership and, and pronunciation in, in particular. Um, yeah, we don't, we're not, we're not bothered. Um, 
I mean, the, the curious thing was that, that, you know, both Cam and I, you know, we head off in, in our own respective directions and we're writing the novels and this is back before email, right? So seeing the other person's drafts uh, was a bit problematic. And so even spellings of character names were different between myself and Cam. <laughs> So you started and, with pronunciation. And so had to so get you learn. Oh, that's you so learn early funny. on. Yeah, you learn early on that eh, it doesn't. You know, um, since it's kind of a recorded history, um, if you read enough sort of uh, history of, of um, well, any kind of history books, um, if, if you go back far enough, spellings of character of, of historical figures can be different depending on who the author is and their own cultural origins. So um, there's a strong, a long precedent for um, variations on, on the naming of, char- uh, naming of people. Uh, you know, if you look at the word Iskander, um, it's Alexander, right? Um, and yet you can use both, the, depending on, you know, how the story or how the history is being told, it can be either one. Um, because there have been cultural influences on, on these historical figure names, character names. So it didn't bother us that, that we were um, displaying some variation um, in the spellings and, uh, mm. I guess, by extension, uh, the pronunciations of words. Also, yeah. Cam's left-handed and I'm right-handed. So, you know, <laughs> there, yeah, it, there's a different mindset at play there, for sure. Well, now I like Some more. of the names are smudged. <laughs> So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. 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 Uh, so this, I think, actually ties really well into one of the questions we got from our Discord community from Agrobrog, uh, specifically about the cultural inspirations. There's so many different people in, within the books. Uh, Agrobrog was wondering, what was the inspiration for the different cultures? Oh, no. Now I have to say all these words. <laughs> Uh, like the Tistiandi, mm-hmm. Falari, Dalhan, Barkas, Grawl, etc. Was it a conscious decision to comp- to create a completely new world, or did th- those things happen organically? Um, yeah, no, it was it was a very conscious. We did not want to pick up and transpose any earth based cultures uh, across into the other world. Um, so cultures are at the same time because of our, our anthropology background the the emergence of cultures and their their specific characteristics generally are you know they'll follow kind of an evolution right so there's hunter gatherer and then horticulture and then agriculture and then state and that kind of thing fairly loose uh it, it, it's it's what we are taught as students uh, in anthropology it's not necessarily always the case in reality but it's it's a good framework um and then as archaeologists, you recognize to the extent to which the environment shapes that culture. Mm-hmm. And so we began with maps and the geography, and then the cultures would then emerge mm-hmm. from the characteristics that we were in place on the maps. Um, and yeah, we, we definitely wanted to uh, keep it as distinct as possible. So there were no uh, obvious correlates uh, in our real world or our real history. Um, and curiously, I've, I've looked at some of my early maps, especially Seven Cities, um, and it was very clear that I had gone to one of my archaeology books, my prehistory books, textbooks, and just pulled out site names, like ancient sites, um, and do, you know, and just inverse a couple of letters, <laughs> twist a few things around, um, and yeah, if you look, I've got this, this is my really old copy of the spines oh, wow. going on this one. Um, wow. But I could probably pick out a few here. Um, well, Dojo Hadding, uh, the sea, that's a site. Um, wow. River is a site. Um, what else? Omari is a site. They're all archaeological sites, basically, uh. <laughs> so, which are obscure, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You won't find them on a regular tourist map. That's cool. Uh, do, you, it's, do you spend a lot of time on the names of things? Uh, I, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. I love naming. I love yeah. naming. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm the same way. Yeah. It's yeah. so interesting that you start with like the maps first because, mm-hmm. again, it sort of like pulls me back to, you know, tabletop RPG 
maps in general, but that was one of the first things that I felt like really hooked me being like, I cannot wait to read more of this world. Like the characters are really beautiful, but from Moonspawn to like reading about Darugistan and like the gas Mm -hmm. sort of channels mm. that are like heating and like the, their whole city's industry is sort of built on these these gas tubes underground natural gas chambers mm-hmm. uh i was like that is awesome it's just so great no question here just <laughs> <laughs> loved them <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, and and that that i think that history and that layer of things built for a reason is Mm -hmm. uh, all too rare, I think, in in fantasy writing. Well, and it's funny. Um, Cam came down here uh, just a few months ago. We had, I can't go into any details, but we had meetings with people. So um, so he came down from Alaska and he and I were uh, sharing a flat um, when we were both at university here uh, in the writing program. And I remember I have a very, very strong memory of this, which um, which we sort of revisited as we were walking uh, through the city of Victoria uh, a little while back. And we had gone to a gaming shop uh, in town and we had bought, it was the first box set of Forgotten Realms. And it was going to contain full color, fold out maps and all kinds of stuff. And I remember we went to a um, Mexican uh, restaurant, which is actually still there. Um, and uh, we ordered our tecates and, and our beer and with, with the lime and all the rest. And we were sitting and we unwrapped this, this, this uh, package. And we pulled out the maps. And I have a very, very distinct memory of both of us sitting in silence looking at this map until one of us said, none of this works geographically. None of, this works. none of this works culturally none of this makes any sense at all and we it's were like they so, just made all this up yeah we were so despondent we were so despondent you had all these cities with no farmland around them you had you had dwarves over here and elves living here and it's it, it's just the river is split and it was like it was just oh man so that's i think at that point we kind of sort of gave up you know in, in some respects that we were going to have to do this ourselves and, and um, build maps out uh, that made sense tectonically, uh, geologically. They just made sense. Um, and, and that's where it really started. I do feel like I detect, however, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, detect some uh, vestiges of uh, uh, tabletop gaming tropes. Like I think, I think you give Mapo a, a bag of infinite holding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just you know, you justify it in your own world. But I love. I, I feel like there are things that uh, were were inspired by uh, tropes that were already existent in, in gaming. Oh right? yeah, oh yeah. And, yeah, and of course, I think even in the gaming, uh, you know, we would take some of those those generic magical items and really mess with them, right? You know, the, the idea of using a, a bag of infinite holding to kidnap people, for example, right. you know, in perpetuity, <laughs> uh, was kind of weird. So yeah, we would always sort of twist these things. And, and um, especially things, I, I, don't, I don't think there's many game systems that employ magic where there's, to our minds, a full enough understanding of what you can do with illusion. Mm. Um, mm. Because you can get away with so much can get away with so much within the game and in fact i remember being in cam and i were in a game being run by another person um i think it was role master actually and he had detailed absolutely everything i mean he could tell you how many steps from one you know one place to another in the wow. city you know all graphed out wow. but it, it turned out to be so rigid um that there was no flexibility and so cam and i were kind of the worst people to be invited into this game because <laughs> he created a, um, a thief who was, I think six, four, maybe 300 pounds. And uh, <laughs> there was nothing subtle about this thief at all. Right? You know, if he was going to go in through a window, he would, he would, you would basically kick, kick in the window and then go in. <laughs> if he was going to go through a door, he just knocked the door down. So there's nothing subtle about him at all. My character was an illusionist whom I described as having art Garfunkel hair. <laughs> and at one point we're out in we're on the street in this in this um 
this amazing city that's fully mapped. And for some reason, we get arrested. And in Rollmaster, I think it's Rollmaster, I guess it's called, um, there's a lot of um, rules for backfires on, mat, on spells. So spells can backfire really badly. Mm. But I was an illusionist. So I created the illusion of a backfired spell that made my head explode <laughs> on the street and just <laughs> fell down, headless, headless corpse. Um, but the inflexibility of the guy running the game and his world meant that he had to arrest that headless corpse <laughs> and bring it to the cells in order to fit with the story that he wanted to, the narrative right. he wanted. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you can do things in, in with uh, an illusionist that actually breaks all the rules. And for for the GM, anyways. Yeah. You know what I mean? I thought maybe you were going to show up to that game and you're like, great, now I'm going to take the demon I have in this vial. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would have if I could have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So I I'm, I'm apologize in advance. I Most of my questions are going to be about tabletop role playing. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> um, I'm just so fascinated uh, by you playing. And, and I mean, I'm. Full disclosure: I'm I'm in the process of converting my campaign into a novel, and oh, cool! I, I, just just to see if I can. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very curious about that process that you went through. And you've talked about uh, you and Mr. Esamont uh, gaming. Was it were there sessions where it was just the two of you? Yeah. And yeah. so you would play multiple characters, right? You said you played yeah. Krupp and Anamander and some other characters. Yeah, I, uh, each of us would roll up uh, minimum three. Or minimum two, but often three, sometimes four characters. Um, and then the other person who's running that campaign would have all the NPCs. Wow. And and would you full role play it where you would get into conversations and con and, and dialogue it we out? We had or? entire entire sessions that were nothing but conversation. Yeah. Nobody wow. pulled a weapon. You Phenomenal. know, and so it was all narrative driven, it was all character based. Um yeah. So we were pushing for that. I mean, at the same time, you know, we're writing short stories in, in the writing program. Um, so narrative and, and character are, are, you know, uh, uppermost in our minds. And we wanted to sort of pull that across into the gaming. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of, uh, I guess you could call literary themes or themes of the human condition sort of began to express themselves you know, in these characters and, and that gives them you know that much more gravitas and depth yeah so when but you would have time, like oh, sorry. sorry go ahead go ahead when you would have like a particularly compelling interaction between these characters <clears throat> would you be like jotting down what was awesome oh, i wish it, or... i wish <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. no that would have been great um but you know you hold the memories of these of those moments right because you know if you both been role playing, um, you know that there there are certain moments that are just um, magical. Magical, um, yeah. Something happens, and uh, everything works out uh, in maybe an unusual way, unexpected way, mm -hmm. but that makes it all the better. Yeah. Um, that that's the th amazing thing that you've captured in the novels. I, I I can't think of another writer that I could say that sentence applies to their writing where it it, it all feels inevitable, but completely mm. unexpected the way we get there yeah lana you were mentioning that a lot that these things just sort of just sort of explosively happening on the page yeah um i think that may actually be a reflection of, of the gaming dynamics don't you think in some I ways think definitely yeah. i mean because it's a dice roll isn't it yes you think about it you never know what's going to happen it could be something great know. so it'd be something oh bad. especially if like the character is realizing something like you know, that's like that history check. Like, do I know this? Have I heard this? And then being like putting together those pieces as the DMs like illustrating things for you and your character's like, oh my gosh, I just thought of this. <laughs> that's yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, amazing. One of one of the things though that I feel like is in contrast to, to game storytelling is that, you know, generally speaking, you start a role-playing campaign with a level one character mm. and you, they become more powerful over time and you end the game with them very powerful and they start and they find out the problem and there's a lot of different problems along the way. But that leads to that, you know, farm boy becomes the savior of the world mm -hmm. story over and over again. And you have eschewed that completely. And even though the, the roots of this were in tabletop storytelling, we, you start our story where, you know, we're at 
the equivalent of level, you know, 20 characters. Ah, but have Except you played Crocus? Ger- ha- yeah, have you played have you played GURPS? I have not. No, I've I've read about it, but I have not played right. it. Right. Because with GURPS you can start with you can start with any level character. There are no uh, levels as such. Okay. So in other words, you're given a uh, you're given points. So I can't remember what it is. On average, the average character, average person, real life person would be a hundred points, and you split those points up to um, skills and talents and and, and uh, physical characteristics. So you can you can build your character um, any way you like, um, and. So for a lot of the characters, we did not want 100 point characters. So we would go 140 points, <laughs> and and so the, suddenly that character now has history. Um, right. They have a life behind them. Um, they have experiences. They have skills, and so on. So so at that point, they're they're living, breathing characters with with that past, as opposed to first level characters. Um, and that's it. Sort of gives you a running head start yeah. in terms of developing your characters. And the other thing you can do is in GURPS, uh, you can buy points back through um, disadvantages. And um, I remember the first GURPS game Cam and I were in, we weren't running it. And it was GURPS had just arrived uh, as a campaign, um, as a, rather as a game system. And one of the other players uh, bought all these huge disadvantages. Um, I think he, and this is going to sound awful, but I think he he had no legs and no arms or something like that. And it was magically active. He was floating. You know, he had all this mana and uh, was able to use wizard eye and to use various magical things to manipulate things uh, all around him, which, you know, sounded interesting, um, challenging to, to, to play that kind of character. Mm. But then the guy who was running the game, um, the, the premise of the story was we were all going to be um, psychically transported into uh, other bodies on another world. And, um, and so that happened and we ended up in, uh, I think it was probably what year, 1989, 1989, San Diego. Um, and so the character who had no arms and no legs was suddenly, and no mana was right. completely, you know, at a loss in terms mm. of what he could do. Um, so GURPS is, 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 it delivers good lessons. Um, mm. You know, if you want to, if you want to physically limit your characters, um, there are, there will be consequences to it and it could, they could be, you know, disastrous for sure. Yeah. Uh, I really find the the character building portion of, of this fascinating. I love not just like, I've never read a book, obviously, with such a variety of characters just by sheer number. Uh, But one of the things I found particularly refreshing about my personal journey through the Malazan world so far is your characterization of gender in the books, or Mm -hmm. more specifically, that you have a bunch of like really badass women as a part of your story. Um, Despite, you know, my very vocal opinions about Felicin's bad attitude. <laughs> um, I think it's rare that I've encountered such like epic fantasies that have as many varied personalities and representations of women. I think I read an article somewhere, just a little bit of a taste that this derived out of these magic systems. Is that because of the influence of GURPS or how did you? No. Was no, that it, deliberate to yeah, be yeah. like, we're um, making sure that we have people who are dope and not just damsel. Yeah, no, we wanted a, um, a completely level uh, world. And one of the things that, that both of us sort of addressed, and we played it out and, and experimented through the gaming, but um, by the time it got to the novels, we were pretty much uh, c- convinced that this is the direction we were going to go. Uh, because we wanted a world without sexism. Mm-hmm. And so we thought, well, okay, you've got magic. Now, as an anthropologist, um, you're going to recognize that depending on the nature of the magic, how it's acquired, how the skill is acquired, um, and its efficacy, um, there are going to be impacts on culture and society. And uh, 
some fairly basic ones. Um, so if magic is uh, a skill set that's acquired through not birthright um, and not gender based, but through basically uh, merit, discipline, um, anybody then can become a magic user. And, and that was the other thing with GURPS um, is that there are no there are no classes as such. Um, you can run right across the gamut. So <clears throat> that, that allowed us to experiment and to, and to try it out um, as a, uh, an approach to the emergence of cultures. So then you're looking at, well, if there's healing magic and it's, and again, efficacious, um, women do not have to become baby factories. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they can produce one or two ch children with the fairly high expectation that those children reach adult adulthood. And so that changes the economics of your social structure uh, in all of these, these tribes and cultures. And that also frees up the women to go off and do whatever they want, because especially in, in a tribal structure, um, child rearing is not nuclear family. It is the entire group rears the children. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, aunts, uh, grandmothers, uncles, you name it. Uh, they're all part of the child rearing process. So that takes a lot of pressure off the biological mother. And so they're then free um, to go off and do whatever they want, uh, depending on their inclinations. Well, that changes everything. Um, because once you have that in place, you quickly realize that you cannot have a gender-based hierarchy of power. Yeah. It cannot exist. Um, Furthermore, if the potential, at least, of magic being accessible to everyone, regardless of gender, um, that very prevalent real-world notion of 51% of the human population potentially living in fear of the 49% mm. does not necessarily apply. Mm. So in other words, a woman walking down an alley at night um, accosted by three men could kill them all <laughs> yeah. right. and so the men know that yeah and so that changes the dynamics uh that things are not simply reduced to physical strength and aggression yeah changes everything and so once you've changed all that you realize that all of these uh social structures and, and hierarchies of power are going to be fundamentally different from how they are with us yeah. Uh, and then that's going to change the military. It's going to change um, attitudes. Uh, it's going to change um, any sense of rigidity uh, in the roles that, that people take, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of gender. So, and once, you know, so once all those rules are in place, then you realize that, you know, you're going to be writing in a world without sexism, but you don't want to signpost it. You don't want to make it yeah. obvious. It just is. And yeah. if the readers catch catch on to it, fantastic. If not, yeah. no big deal. I think that's like one of like the most beautiful things about it is that it was just so natural and seamless. It was like, oh, it's like mundane in a way. And I feel like I only noticed it because it's usually so in my face that a book is either like feminism, I'm with it, or like there are characters that I'm like, that's just not. <laughs> yeah. no person feels that way you don't have to write this person because <laughs> yeah. they're a woman to well, sound like and, this and, and it you just were didn't writing this in, at all. in 1991 yeah you know it's like it Amazing. makes sense today well, like no, this is what you just, <laughs> we were gaming it before that yeah, right? yeah. so we, we rolled up female characters all the time we played female characters cam played oh you haven't met her yet lady envy wait till you meet lady envy <laughs> think about <laughs> think about this um that, that she is a gamed character yeah okay I, yeah. I love. I look it. forward to it. I mean, did, did you guys go into a situation where, like, I mean, I guess this is all before the novels were being written, but did you go into a a game session with the specific idea to game out a certain scenario that, like, narratively that you wanted to figure out? Were you using it as a tool? I guess is my question. It was more to um, to build a cohesive, internally consistent. Um, fantasy world, secondary world. Mm. That was kind of some one that applied as much of the of our anthropological learnings as we could, that we could even think of. 
Yeah. Um, and then to see how how that changes uh, in terms of historical dynamics, um, and it does it changes everything. Yeah. Um, because you do not have, you know, so much of fantasy is is um, Eurocentric, um, medieval, uh, yeah, paternalistic kind right. of approaches. So, you know, if, if you're going to write that kind of stuff, you're basically picking up the whole package from our world and transplanting it in another world. But that picks up all the same limitations on the characters. Yeah. And, you know, if you want to write about that and those limitations and characters fighting against the patriarchy or whatever, f- fair enough, you know, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, we wanted that argument to be done and dusted, uh, you know, from day one in our world. That one's over with. You know, the the battle of the sexes is long gone. Yeah. It never existed um, because the cultures arose in immersed in magic uh, that unplugs all of those those hierarchies, those, uh, those structures. It, again, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but it's just it, it, reading it in 2023, it just seems so contemporary and obvious almost. But the idea that you were doing that in the late eighties, it's like you were so far ahead of the curve on that. I think No, it's... you guys are so young. I mean, really, <laughs> it, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, no, okay. I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean that in a bad I mean, way. I, was alive. I, I hear from <laughs> Jeff all the time. I'm used yeah. to Lana it. wasn't I'm even a alive baby. then, Mr. Wah, Exxon. Wah. I, at least I was alive. <laughs> Man, I wore, uh, uh, I, I, I've kept an archaeology t-shirt um, from a survey that, that I did. That I used to design t-shirts as well. So I kept it and I put it on um, on the Saturday when there was a public archaeology part uh, just like, a couple weeks ago. It's got a date on it. The date is 1982, the Petroform <laughs> survey. That shirt is actually older than the entire crew on that project. <laughs> but in any case... Um, and I probably mean, works harder too. No, I'm yeah. <laughs> well, it was pointed out that even though it's a black t-shirt, you can see my skin right through it. That's how thin it was. It's hilarious. So I probably got a sunburn wearing the shirt. Um, but, I mean, my wife is a, a, an ardent feminist. Uh, and this battle was going on, you know, when I was still, the whole movement sort of took fire when I was in my mid teens. Um, yeah. so I grew up with, with feminism, uh, with the whole, you know, seeing on television, the, the bra burning and the marches mm. and all the rest. It was, it built into my, my experience, uh, in the world. Um, so that battle has been around for a long time. I think that in many respects, the saddest thing is that it seems to have staggered back a few steps yeah. uh, of recent, uh, of late. So it, it never felt like it, like we were kind of cutting edge at all. We were simply incorporating our sensibilities of what we knew uh, growing up. I, I, that's what I'm saying. In ter- it's a generational thing that, that the experiences, um, that preceded your arrival on this planet, um, you know, covered a lot of the same ground and mm-hmm. fought those same battles. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was kind of taken as, as given that we were going to maybe step away from what was so um, almost cliched within the fantasy genre to carry across that patriarchy. We just did not want it because it did not reflect the world around us at the time. Yeah. Didn't reflect awesome. it at all. Yeah. Um, I know we're getting, we're going, Lana predicted. She's like, we're never going to get to all our questions. Like, ah, and she was right. As usual, she's right. Uh, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit about your writing in particular, because I, I know it's a topic that you uh, speak eloquently on. Um, one of the things I admire very much about your writing is how you manage, and, and I, I'm sure this comes from your short story training, but um, how you manage to always start in media res, you know, mm-hmm. the, you, you, can you talk a little bit about trimming the fat and getting to the meat of a scene fast? Wow. Um, have you got like three hours? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it is, it, it comes, it derives from um, sensibilities that are drilled into you as a short story writer. Um, you need quite often, uh, especially if, if you're you're a beginning writer um and you're opening a a story that you've begun 
um, where you write two or three pages and then realize that, you know, it's it, the, novel, the story actually starts on paragraph six <laughs> or seven. Everything else you did was necessary for you to get to that place, but it's not necessary for the reader. So you excise all of that uh, and, and away you go. Mm. Um, the other thing, of course, with short stories is you really have to avoid as much expositional info dumping as possible. Mm. So you need to sew those relevant details into the narrative, uh, into the actions, uh, into the descriptions of setting, um, so that they're, they're basically part of the fabric, but you're not underlining that stuff. You're not sort of putting it yeah. in bold. Um, so it's there and it's there to, um, I mean, world building occurs in every work of fiction. Um, doesn't matter what genre it's in. Uh, even if you set it in your hometown, you're still world building because the details you choose are the ones that you've elevated above all those other details. And then the question is, why did you choose them? And can you do more with them? Um, and that, and that's sort of, I guess the second, the second pass on what you've written, right? Because when you're, you know, you're writing that first draft, you're just getting it all out there. Mm. And then you need to go back and, and take a look at it and see, well, where can I build, um, connotation and resonance, uh, in those details of, of the setting and character actions and, are they strong enough to echo them later on? And so that's that's part of your paring down process. Mm. That you know, all the details that you're going to put in there, you want to be driving um, some aspect of the narrative, even through subtext. Um, so I remember somebody telling me, I didn't see it, but somebody had done um, a quote, an edit on uh, the opening of Gardens of the Moon not long ago uh, on YouTube. And um, first of all, it was astonishing that anybody would even do that because it's not imputing me. It's imputing my, my editor. You know? <laughs> it's like, why would you do this? This, this, is, this, this editor of mine has been in the business um, longer than I've been a writer. And the guy's good, right? And he worked at, at Penguin. He worked at Pelican. You know, he's a professional editor. Um, and you know, the opening of gardens of the moon, it's, it's that weather vane. That's, that's how the whole thing starts. Yeah. Um, and I think this person had issues with that, but there is symbolic meaning to that weather vane and the fact that it's wayward and the fact that the mm. winds of history are, are turning it in mm. unexpected directions, which is foreshadowing the entire 10 book series. Right. Yeah. So it's there for a reason. Um, I don't know why I got off on this tangent, but anyways, <laughs> it, it is a case of when you, when you describe something, um, especially if it's going to be the opening thing of uh, either a novel or uh, a 10 volume series of three and a half million words, whatever it turned out to be. Um, you need to be deliberate in what you're doing and the expectation, uh, you know, of, of an editor or a reader that you're not being deliberate is is actually absurd right because you, jeff you're writing right you are very deliberate and conscious of the word choice sentence mm. structure pattern rhythm all of these things yeah that are all intended to create an effect and that's the effect you're looking for or you're hoping to tr yeah. create that effect in the reader and the rewriting process is simply fine-tuning and honing um, that word selection, the rhythms of the sentences, um, the patterns that, that are, are built into uh, that narrative um, in order to uh, make as clear as possible the effect you're going for. Mm -hmm. So that if you are challenged by anybody saying, well, why did you write that? You can give a damn good reason for why you wrote it the way you did. Mm. Right? That's... Yeah. You know, that's the thing that as writers, we have to be prepared to do. Um, so to get jumped on on the assumption that we didn't know what we were doing is, you know, absolutely absurd. Yeah. 
I love the way that you talk about that specifically about infusing the world through every part of it, the subtext, the not like, not just like here's exposition. Now here's dialogue mm. next scene. Um, it actually, like even the way you're talking, like, Oh, you know, caring about the rhythm timing, et cetera. I could feel like I could take everything you just said and give that to animation students as well. And like the same cool. sort of, yeah, of course. Yes. And that, reading the book, I mentioned it in one of the episodes. Um, so I'm an animator by by trade. That's my key craft. There's many scenes that you have written that I can like perfectly picture these animated scenes or specific dialogue pieces in the same way that, you know, it comes from that, that tabletop space of like, we sort of see things through the reactions of characters a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's how I realize <laughs> something big has happened. Mm -hmm. To me, yeah. I'm like, I like daydream about animating these scenes because of those beautiful subtext moments, because I'd be like, oh, I could, there'd be such a great gear shift animation from like listening to shocked to scared to like, it's, I, uh, I love that infusion of the story through all the pieces, like bursting at the seams with what this world is and not just one thing or the other. Well, I mean, interestingly, my minor um, in the writing program was film studies mm. and and so I remember we, we bought this huge um, black and white television uh, from a, a Goodwill or something along those lines. Mm. It, it nearly killed us getting it home um, because we didn't have a vehicle. <laughs> it's one of those, you know, the really big ones that you can, yeah. you can put an aquarium on top of it if you wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely huge. Um, but it was also the time when a lot of videotapes were, uh, of classics were being reissued and they were selling for super cheap. So we were watching all of these classic black and white films. And there's something to be said for that, those kind of films, because they are, they are so succinct mm -hmm. and yet so rich in, in, in the depth of the images. And, mm -hmm. and as you know, in animation, it's the same thing. Like there is nothing accidental on that yeah. screen, nothing. Every mm -hmm. single detail is there for a reason. And you can really start, you know, parsing that out easily in, in the black and white films because the pacing of black and white, well, of early films is far slower um, than our modern pacing. And I think our modern pacing absolutely loses so much nuance in, in the potential of film that um, people who are only familiar with that kind of stuff are, are end up being almost unaware of, you know, all of that hidden potential. Um, yeah. You, know, you think of an early film where a character wakes up in the morning in, in, in hotel room bed and gets up and goes to the bathroom and shaves and showers and gets dressed and, and walks down the st or either walks down the stairs or takes the elevator down onto the main uh, into the lobby, uh, passes through the lobby, steps outside and gets into a cab. OK. Old films would have shown you all of that. Modern films. You get a close-up of the eyes snapping open on the bed. Uh, they sit up in a room that's clearly a hotel room. Next scene, they're getting in the cab. Yeah. Um, we've cut all that stuff. All that. So we're now, our films are basically this huge melange of shorthand. All the transitions have been cut out. Mm. Um, and in fiction, um, you know, the great writers who write about, who wrote about writing, would tell you that transitions are essential to narrative. And I think what often is happening is we take too much of that modern filmic approach um, to our to our novels. So the transitions disappear. Um, but they are crucial. They are crucial. So this the, the transitions um, that you may have seen or maybe even not have, not have consciously seen but you have actually experienced are quite often built into those scenes where it seems something happens out of the blue. It's mm. actually not out of the blue. It's built in. So. Yeah. That, that leads to one of the questions that I've, I've been dying to ask you, which is, you know, these, these are novels that have books, chapters, <laughs> and scenes in them. Yeah. <laughs> You're already laughing. <laughs> uh, what, 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 Define all those for me it, it, <laughs> to you. Like what, what constant, what, why that structure? What, how do you know when, what 
is a chapter end as opposed to a scene end? Is it just feeling? How many feeling, chapters or is there... belong in a book? <laughs> How many chapters should we read per episode? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very strange. Uh, I know Gardens of the Moon is, is sort of the outlier of all of them because I think there's – I don't know how many books there are in Gardens of the Moon. Four. Four? No. Book what? No, this book. Gardens of the Moon, I think seven or eight. You're it? right. I lied instantly. <laughs> Event- that Event- was a test and you passed. <laughs> Eventually, the series breaks down to four books per novel. Yeah. And always 24 chapters, and, right? And right. it just, and yeah. that was so weird. I wasn't planning that. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. It just, when I mapped out each, each, novel that came out at 24 freaking chapters hmm. it was really spooky um <laughs> i was not planning that uh so and you know it wouldn't it wouldn't even alter it wouldn't be altered by length either right yeah that's even weirder yeah anyways um i have no idea why why i set it up that way i mean in many respects i'm not writing novels anyways i'm writing short stories um <laughs> short stories um, within short stories. So each particular scene is a discrete construct, um, which then folds into the larger construct going all the way up to the macro scale of not just one novel, but all 10, mm-hmm. right? So it was one way for me to be able to manage something that I visualize as being enormously long and possibly taking over a decade to write without being intimidated. Um, you know, you're starting page one and you're thinking, well, I've got 10, 10 novels to go. That's pretty, that can stop you in your tracks, right? Cause it just feels overwhelming. But if your focus is on this scene right here, right now with these characters and, and you build that scene as perfectly as you're capable of doing, then when it's done, it just drops away and you move on to the next scene and you do that over and over and over again. And before you know it, you've got a novel and before mm-hmm. you know it, you've got 10 novels, but it's all manageable. <laughs> it's all manageable because what you are tackling is a discrete controllable yeah. size of narrative. And you're going to build that. At least this is my approach. Anyways, I build that as a short story. And um, so whatever, is the opening of that scene I'm going to echo by the close of that scene in some yeah. fashion. And that makes it a discrete unit. And it's satisfying as a reader, I think. Um, that was my hope anyways. So that feels complete. And then you move on to the next one and the next one and the next one. So I know, Jeff, I'm like looking at the time. But I'm I know, still going to ask this question. We, we've already <laughs> over an hour. We've taken so much of your time. But no, no, no. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm happy I'm to do this. One more and then. Jeff, you could take it from there. But with this idea of like just the complexity and like the sheer scope of the books, the way that Jeff pitched these books to me and that I've heard since is that the books of the fallen are one of the most notoriously challenging fantasy series. It's like the most notoriously challenging fantasy series of all time. How do you feel about owning that kind of title or having that be the sort of description of these novels? And do you agree? Um, I never intended them to be challenging. Um, and I know AP Canavan has a, you know, a very good um, Critical Dragon uh, program where he basically points out that it's not as challenging as you think it is. I think we've both decided that, yeah. that that was a real misnomer. I yeah. we don't we don't agree with that label either, but it yeah. it, it does persist. That's uh, that's why I'm so fascinated that it does exist. And yeah. like like how soon after getting these published, like when you see more and more people start reading these and they're like, This is so challenging. Or are you like, What? Or are you like, Yeah. I, <laughs> I didn't intend it, but I got big I brains. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, one of the things I did was I, I, I lifted the structure from, from Frank Herbert's Dune um, mm. in many respects. What I really liked about specifically the first book, Dune, was that it was embedded in a history. And so you had these uh, epi- epigraphs at the beginning of chapters that were clearly post-events and analyzing that history. 
and there were mm -hmm. sort of little mini essays discussing various things. Um, I absolutely adored that because it, it conveyed a level of authenticity um, that was just in place structurally, and it was expected that there would be commentary on the events that were going to be occurring. So I looked at that uh, structurally, and then um, a lot of that novel, well, Dune begins in media res. I mean, it's you're just you're dropped right into a, um, a very complex um, geopolitical scenario there that you have to kind of piece together that that this is um, this is almost a, a medieval style uh, reimagining. Um, it, I mean, there's a lot of fantasy elements in, in Dune. So it didn't seem like a, a, a long stretch to pull that into a, an epic fantasy setting. So it never occurred to me that that was going to be in any way unusual um, or unfamiliar to the point where readers are thrown out by the narrative, uh, but being dropped into the middle of a story. Um, mind you, I grew up reading both science fiction and fantasy. I think if, if, if you have a fan base that is immersed exclusively in fantasy, that's really, this stuff's going to throw them. But if they've grown up reading science fiction, it shouldn't throw them at all. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I, I certainly grew up, my first love genre wise was sci-fi. Like that mm -hmm. was, I, I read the foundation novels mm. very young and that was like what did it for me. And all I cared about was future, future, future stuff. Give me sci-fi, give me future stuff. Dune, I mean, I, I would all Arthur C. Clarke and Heinlein mm -hmm. and like, I just devoured all of it. Yeah, and I came too. to fantasy after that. Uh, so maybe that is part of the explanation is why I Yeah, don't... I mean, were you, did you find Gardens of the Moon problematic in that respect? No. I, I mean, uh, part of that, I we've talked about this on the show, is is um, that there was such a big deal made of it that I read about uh, yeah. in anticipation yeah. of reading Gardens of the Moon that I, that I didn't know if that I just, you know, built myself up to be bewildered by it um, mm -hmm. and then wasn't. Uh, but I honestly, I still hear, you know, I'll see a booktuber talking about, oh, I gave up on Gardens of the Moon. I was like, mm. what are you talking about? Like from page one, I was completely enthralled. Mm. Like I was in. So I don't, I don't understand that take, but it, it, it is one that I've heard a lot and I'm sure yeah, you have even and, more. And I, I'm just theorizing, but I mean, it may be that they have been reading exclusively in fantasy. Yeah. Um, because there are some very, very sort of um, almost overwhelming structural expectations uh, mm. to epic fantasy that they follow a particular pattern and format, mm. um, which is probably a false sensibility anyways, because there's a lot of variation out there. Um, yeah. And there always has been in fantasy. Look at Glenn Cook's Black Company stuff. That's That breaks all those rules right off the start. And you know, that's an old series. It's been around mm -hmm. for a while. So uh, it, it, it quite often, I think it may depend on the uh, reading history of the commentator. Um, yeah. If they're not familiar with this stuff, uh, if they've not read uh, science fiction um, and, or experimental epic fantasy and that kind of stuff, then yeah, uh, this, this may feel very unfamiliar to them. And to me, it'll take, a, take a while to get grounded. Yeah. To me, it seemed like it it really ties back into like that thing that I talked about on the podcast on the time, and I, I mentioned here as well, is that feeling of it really feels like you you trust me to hear something and then register it again when it pops up later. And I feel like if somebody has been in a space with any kind of author who is a little bit more heavy handed with being like, "This is foreshadowing," uh, the, the, that I don't find that to be present. It, in the heavy handed way, but it's definitely there. And so when things happen later, I'm like, oh yeah. But if I were to sit down and like, I often talk about like the de letting the details kind of wash over me versus trying to like nitpick every page and try and understand everything that is said, which I honestly feel like anybody who's sort of into a, a, a sci-fi or fantasy, like wanting to understand all the intricacies, especially with a cool world like this, I feel like they'll get lost in an individual page and sort of miss the, the broader story. Mm. Um, that that seems to be like, that's the closest thing I could do is like a connection to why people would be challenged by it because it is such a different flavor of um, writing. I don't mm. know. You know, 
one of our favorite things about the two novels we've read so far, uh, and honestly, it, it feels kind of weird talking to you. You have you've written so many books, and we've literally read two of them. It's just like yeah. we're, we come <laughs> we come <laughs> unarmed to this uh, to this discussion. <laughs> Apologies, uh, our our recording software stopped recording at some point, uh, so I don't know where that is. Uh, but uh, Mr. Erickson was speaking so eloquently about um, <laughs> <laughs> judging his characters or or not judging them, and, mm -hmm. um, uh, loving his characters, and I, I hopefully we didn't lose a lot of that. But yeah, um, that's the place to begin. Yeah, as a writer, um, yeah, you have to have compassion for your characters, um, and to simply stay with them regardless of, of the consequences. So yeah, I, I cannot repeat uh, everything I just said. <laughs> you know, no, no <laughs> what I want you to. It's kind of a one-off thing. That was uh, just once... for us. It was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we appreciate it. Um, I, we, won't, we won't take too much uh, more of your time. Uh, Lena, do you have a, a last question that you wanted to? A get last to? question or that for, I wanted or to get to? Or just for you. I, I have a couple of, uh, of quick things. One of them is, uh, I promised our, our Discord I would ask you, uh, is there, uh, there's evidently some rumor of the fact that uh, Broken Binding is doing new hardcore mm -hmm. cover editions. Is that mm -hmm. true? Yeah. As very, far as I know, it is. Very yeah. exciting. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, a question I always like to ask folks uh, anytime I'm like interviewing somebody that I'm not super familiar with like their other interviews and stuff they've been a part mm -hmm. of, but is there a question about you as a writer or about your work on this series that you always wish you were asked about, but you rarely or never are? Um, is there a question? Not really. Uh, <laughs> I, I get asked like all kinds of, um, um, I know AP often asks me in public, you know, what's my favorite color? Yeah. <laughs> Clearly green, it looks yeah. like. <laughs> Apparently. Apparently yeah. um, no, but I love talking about writing. Um, that's, you know, that's my obsession. That's, that's the thing that's, that's driven me um, all along. So to talk about writing just, yeah, it, that fires me up. And I'm always happy to talk about writing. So we can, we can certainly... Um, uh, come back at another date, uh, regardless of the books, and just talk writing. I would love that very, very yeah. much. You have been so generous with your time, and uh, it's just, I don't, we have said it to you a number of times, I will repeat <laughs> it, because uh, it has given us so much joy that you even uh, checked out what we had to say about the novels, and um, just your engagement and uh, willingness to uh, interact with us has been such a uh, delight. So thank you very much for that. Well, yes. there's no way I'm going to miss that dancing at the beginning. Of the <laughs> it's absolutely awesome. <laughs> Come for the dancing, stay for the discussion of amazing novels. Yes. Uh, uh, and thank you, Stephen Erickson, for uh, being with us. Thanks for writing these these books. I look forward to speaking with, with you again in the future. I hope we can make this happen again. Mm -hmm. uh, but this has been an extreme pleasure. So thank you very well, much. Well, I, I, I hope you I hope you enjoy Memories of Ice. Um, it picks up where Gardens of the Moon left off, and it happens time-wise in parallel with what you just read. Yeah. Oh, can't I, wait. I, I, I told Lana, and Lana hasn't started yet, but I told her I read the prologue, and I'm already, like, gobsmacked by the prologue. I was like, this is incredible. So um, we're, we're very much excited to keep, keep, cool. keep going. Uh, cool. Yeah, especially because yeah. there's so many, like, little teasers. Every time, we, every time we've, we, you know, we've phoned the other continent in the – in yes. uh, Dead House Gates. It's like, something's going on. I'm bleeding out. <laughs> oh, yeah. You really need this now? Okay, great. I'm like, what's <laughs> happening over there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can't wait. Yes. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, and yeah. uh, thanks for watching, folks. Uh, please, we love your comments um, and uh, your your support. Uh, the, there's the Discord at uh, 5x5DLC on Discord. Uh, and there's also um, the uh, DLC video game show you can check out. We'll yeah. see you next time. Thanks for being with us.